team used one of the public tracks in City Park for practice because there were no sports facilities at the school. Jonah dropped Luce off and parked under the live oaks to wait and give her a ride to the restaurant afterward. There were other people about walking strollers in the lanes, throwing footballs in the infield. Folks wore sweaters in the cool air. Luce's teammates jawed while they sat on the on the rubber surface and stretched. Luce had her own routine. Their coach was a math teacher who had been pressed into service. He didn't try to tell the girls much of anything, except for organizing the list of events and having them sign up for what they each wanted. Two girls came to blows over the relay anchor, so Luce waited and took what was left, the 400 and the 800. The track team was not very good. The girls weren't very athletic. But Luce discovered she had a talent for the sport herself and took her practice seriously. There was something she liked, something she couldn't quite define, about the craft of getting somewhere new as quickly as possible. And when she felt particularly good about herself, this ability played into the fantasy she allowed, a future with Jonah, college, a life she could build on her own with him. She took herself through her warm-ups and form drills, exercises she'd found on the internet at Jonah's one day. The other girls jibed, and if Luce retorted at all, she'd make a sweet face and say something in Spanish, which made them laugh. She ran a few lazy laps and then readied for a full speed 400. When she ran, she imagined a ghost runner chasing her, a cold presence at her hip. It was never truly the other girl she competed with, but rather this figure. She always imagined it as a he who was compiled out of whatever lay at hand. The ghost runner came from the thin, limbo feeling she lived with as the only Latina daughter in the neighborhood, even if there were other boys she knew, other recién llegados, who were close to her own age. The ghost runner came from the Spanish she spoke at home and the English she spoke at school. The ghost runner came from the frequent despair, those feelings that flared when she thought of the future, and the deep truth that none of her fantasies was reality. It came from when she thought of her past, and the country where she'd left her mother buried, that nowhere place she'd crossed thirsty with her uncle, whom she'd not seen since he left her at her father's door in Texas, when she thought of her father's own despair, when the work started to thin, times her father and Rodrigo had been robbed, her ghost runner derived from all these feelings, and as she broke into her sprint, he sprang to her side, cold, shouldering against her, she often had nightmares in which she couldn't outrun him because her legs wouldn't work well enough. But in real life, she reached with her strides and outpaced him. And when she outpaced him, she always won. Today, though, her legs felt numb, as in the, as in the nightmares. Muscles that normally fired more quickly than she was aware were sluggish, a glacial stride and slowing. Her breasts ached, bouncing in her sports bra, and she finished her circumference of the track more breathless than usual. She straightened with her hands on her hips and sucked at the cool, lung-searing air. She was two weeks late by Mardi Gras day, but she hadn't said anything to Jonah yet. She had promised to meet Jonah and Colby in Central City for the Zulu parade. It was cold out, but Luce felt like she was burning up. The parade was already rolling when she arrived, floats packed tight with riders and black and white face paint. They wore vibrant frills and robes and skirts made of straw. They chucked beads and toy spears into the throngs of people bunched against the curb. Sometimes a rider held aloft a rare prized coconut painted gold or silver or decorated with rhinestones. This was the evolution of a century-old tradition. The crowd lost themselves at the sight, held arms high, strained their fingers, and the rider picked his favorite and tossed the throw. The bouncing cadence of the bands between the floats punctuated all of it. The boys were already drunk by the time Luce found them. Colby had a bottle of whiskey stashed in his backpack. They offered Luce a swig. She put on a good face and abstained, and they kept offering, having forgotten they'd already tried. There had been good moments earlier in carnival season, dancing with the boys to marching bands, competing for the best throws from the floats, celebrating the Saints' victory in the Super Bowl. But today, the ability to be present eluded Luce. A sharp smack near her ear made her snap, too. Colby was standing there, shaking out his hand. He bent and picked up the coconut, a beautiful thing painted a solid and gleaming silver. He grinned, his drunken eyes bloodshot. He tapped his temple. Thing was going to hit you right there, he said. Relief blossomed in Luce's belly, and she leaned and kissed Colby on the cheek. An overwhelming release, like she might float away.
Certainly she could have been injured, and Colby had saved her from that, but the feeling struck her as incommensurate with simple personal gratitude. Luce backed out of the crowd. Toward the end of the day, they found themselves in the Marigny, downriver from the French Quarter. Luce followed as the boys listed through the costumes people on Frenchman Street, and in the darkening day, they stumbled upon some otherworldly drum corps on the corner. Men and women wearing costumes of horns and chains and red flashing lights. They had snares and bass drums, and some had triangles that they dinged or cymbals they crashed. And one man wearing a skeleton mask shouted dancing orders into a megaphone as the revelers passed. Jonah and Colby fell in with the gathering group. Luce did her best to laugh as Jonah pulled her into the fold, but everybody reeked of liquor and sweat. The stench clawed up her nostrils and thrust itself down her throat and her stomach clenched against it. Wet bodies slid against her. She was jostled about, vulnerable, exposed. A panic rose like acid, and she ran. The boys found her halfway down the block, but she couldn't explain what the matter was. She didn't want to. And this is why such relief had flooded her when Colby blocked the coconut. Conscious thought drew even with her biology. The world went wobbly, and Jonah caught her, and he laughed, thinking she was drunk like him. Confronting authors with real questions about the writing process, the difficult and disheartening publishing industry, and why anyone would choose to torture themselves in the world of writing, this is the Literally Podcast, with your host, writer, runner, and the literary voice of Ogden, Utah, Case Johnston. Exposing literature, the authors, the business, the process, the Literally Podcast. I'm Case Johnson. This is the Literally Podcast. We're talking with Nicholas Maneri about his new book, The Infinite, uh, published by Harper Perennial. We're doing this live uh, FaceTime. All right, so looking at that passage, it's really a pivotal passage, and I don't know how much you really want to give away, but um, I mean, within the reading itself, you you understand that... The protagonist, and I would call Luce the protagonist. Would I mean? Would you define Luce as the protagonist, or would you define Jonah as the protagonist? I, I'd say that they're sort of co-protagonists. You know, I think of them sort of um, in the middle, um, um, in a, in it together. You know, sort of sharing the sharing that sort of central responsibility. Okay. Yeah, carrying the story. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and yeah. so this piece. I mean, in this piece, obviously, the reader finds out that Luce is pregnant um, mm-hmm. uh, with Jonah's baby. Um, but, uh, Jonah just still doesn't know. So it's a really kind of interesting, uh, point of view for, for the reader to, they're able to look in and say, okay, well, both Jonah and, and Colby, they're, they're intoxicated. Um, so they think that, that Luce is just intoxicated with them. That's why she's sick. So it's a really cool pivotal moment. And I don't know if you want to get into what happens right after the, which really kind of turns into the catalyst for a lot of the book. Um, what, what do you want to share about that? Yeah, sure. No problem. Um, um, yeah, so Luce is pregnant and um, sort of slowly acknowledging that, admitting it to herself. Um, and soon after this, um, she gets to a point where she can't really um, avoid it or deny it any longer. And once she has to start telling people, then things change. I should also say probably that um, Jonah and Luce together, you know, they, they're in love. They've had sort of these these troubled lives Um they're young, 17 and 18 years old. Um, their, their lives up to this point have been defined in large part by loss, by tragedy, by trauma and, and really each other, you know, falling in love, discovering each other. This has been the the best one of the, you know, one of the best things that's ever happened to them. This is sort of their, their solace. And now it all starts falling apart when Luce is pregnant. Um, Luce is undocumented in, in New Orleans along with her father, who moved to New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina five years before this, almost five years before this, for construction work. And, um, and once she has to tell her father he's, he's livid and eventually um, forces her to return home to northeastern Mexico, where she's from, to be with her grandmother. And that, that separation, her returning, 
Jonah trying to figure out what to do, what happens to Luce after she returns home. That That is, I think you called it the catalyst. That's sort of the thing that drives the, the rest of the narrative. Yeah. yeah, it's really interesting. And I don't want to get into stuff that happens later in the book, but this idea of this influx of, of hired work after c- catastrophe. Um, how... Mm-hmm. Have, Brad and I are aren't from New Orleans. We don't we didn't get we don't get to see that inside view of it. But it, how how close to the truth was that after Katrina, or how close to the truth was that after any type of uh, catastrophe that you've uh, been a part of, or been around, or been within that community? Yeah, I moved to New Orleans in early two thousand and eight, about two and a half years after Katrina, and. Uh, um, or go, go about three, I guess. Um, many of my first neighbors were laborers from Mexico and Central America that had, that had come to town. You know, by some estimates, close to a hundred thousand people came to the city for for work in the in the in that sort of reconstruction rebuilding phase right after. And one of the things that I that I realized upon moving here, and while I was you know new in the city, falling in love with it myself, knowing that I wanted to make it my own home. I realized that the the speed and the strength with which New Orleans was rebuilding itself and coming back from this utter catastrophe, um, it, that process owed itself to this influx of workers. Um, it was all happening on their on their shoulders. Absolutely. And yeah, so I, th- you know, that was that was one of the things that inspired this story. I think that was, a lot of that was rattling around in my head. Yeah, that's a really interesting. That's a really interesting fact that I don't think a lot of people know that to rebuild an American city, we have, we, we, a lot of the labor came on the backs or the shoulders of, of, of immigrants. And, um, Mm -hmm. seeing that in this book, um, it's kind of, I mean, there's a lot of stuff that brought me to, uh, reach out to you to say, let's, let's talk about this book. One of them is this idea of this positive influence of immigrants in our country. Um, yeah. and then the secondly is this, I, uh, this, uh, I would guess this shared love of Mexico. Um, I was fortunate to spend, uh, uh four months in Mexico during school, doing a study abroad and in, in, uh, Michoacan and Michoacan now, as you know, is really in, in Morelia is really, really in trouble when it comes to the drug cartels. I mean, it's, it's mm-hmm. dangerous. Um, you see it on the, on when, when, uh, national security sends out those emails all the time that say, okay, don't go to this part of the country. Um, and which is really hard because I look at that part of the country and I love it. I lived with pe- I lived with a family for four months and it was just beautiful. And the Mexican people are absolutely beautiful. And, um, I love, I, I, I love Mexico. I love the Mexican people and I love the immigrants that have come from there. And so that's when I started to, you know, I looked and I said, you know, I got to read this book first off and then, and then we got to talk to Nick. Um, yeah, cool. what was it, what is it about, um, about Mexico too that draw that drew you to writing about it? Well, I, um, sound similar to you. I spent a couple summers in Mexico doing study abroad stuff while I was in graduate school. Um, most of my experiences were in the uh, state of Guanajuato, San Miguel de Allende, Guanajuato, Leon, that, that area. And, you know, I mean, I, I love Mexico, you know, I, I, you know, it's a place that had a profound impact on me, I think, you know, I, I can't say that I was there doing research for this novel. You know, this this wasn't an idea that occurred to me until sometime after that fact. It's probably not a story I would have attempted to write had it not been for those experiences. Mm-hmm. Um, and then um, I guess I just kept thinking about it when I was in New Orleans, you know, and, and meeting a lot of the people who'd come to town, being moved by their stories. And also, I don't know, you, you know, you're, you're talking about your affinity for, for – many, um, immigrants that come, come to our country and make it a better place. And, uh, and I remember that year that I moved to new Orleans, um, you know, the guy, there's a group of, um, six guys that, that lived in an apartment right above mine. And they're really friendly guys, you know, have a, have a beer on the stoop with them kind of guys, you know? And, uh, I, I appreciated spending time with them. Then a few months later, once the election season of 2008 rolled around, you know, there were, television ads coming on TV vilifying the, the, the you know, 100,000 people that had come to town in order to, to help rebuild it all for political, um, you know, political gain. And I was, I was appalled by that, frankly. And of course, you know, in the, in the eight years since then, we've only seen that rhetoric sort of multiply by the thousands, uh, which is, which has been upsetting. 
and so I don't know. I'm kind of talking around some of this stuff, but but uh, but I think probably the novel began in some in some ways with with a sense of injustice, you know, that I, that I was sort of perceiving in the community around me. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And you can see it. And along with that, you can see the cities. And I don't want to tell too people too many things about um, about the book, but you see the cities of Guanajuato and you see the city of San Miguel de Allende in the book. And, and I knew you had been there, you know, just because of, <laughs> and I, I, I was fortunate to go to both those cities and that they're just beautiful. There's beautiful cities, yeah, these, these art meccas right in the middle of Mexico that uh -huh. you just would, would blow your mind. I'm Case Johnson. This is the Literally Podcast. We're talking with Nicholas Maneri about his new book, The Infinite, uh, published by Harper Perennial. We're doing this live uh, FaceTime. Um, Nick is in New Orleans at the moment. So I understand what you mean with, in the fact that you, when you were in Mexico, you weren't thinking about writing about Mexico. But those mm -hmm. seeds are there, you know, and you can see it and you can feel it uh, within the book. Um, I'm going to skip a little bit to other research. What other research did you feel like you needed to do to make this book um, authentic uh, throughout? I mean, there's there's drug cartels. You can read that on the back. Um, yeah. There's drug cartels. There's um, different people within the community. There's border issues that you would have to mm -hmm. kind of uh, dive into to make sure right. you got those right. Um, what other research did you find yourself uh, digging into to make it real? Authentic? Yeah. Yeah. It's a funny question in a way because we were just talking about Mexico and being there, not thinking about writing about it, but an experience that comes to inspire or inform the thing that you write later on. It's much the same way in New Orleans for me, where where you know about half the novel is set, or maybe a little less than that. Um, you know, for a long time, I I wasn't trying to write anything about New Orleans or set in New Orleans, but it soaks in 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 some ways. I guess one of the things that I did early on, well actually sort of immediately before the idea of this novel occurred to me was, was I visited a friend's classroom at a local high school, a high school that had fallen on pretty hard times in the years since Hurricane Katrina, and it was set to close and be converted into a charter school, which most of the high schools in New Orleans are now charter schools. Um, but all the students, all the teachers, the principal, everybody knew the school was closing. Everybody that was left in the school were the ones that didn't have any other options. And the, and the school had become a pretty chaotic place. The drug trade in the city was spilling into the hallways in really, really dramatic fashion. And my friend who was teaching there was telling me some of these stories. I asked him if I could come observe and see see what he was talking about. I was interested. I, w I wasn't really intending to write anything about that or inspired by that. But once I got there and, and met a lot of his students who were really funny, resilient, you know, Good kids, smart kids, really right. capable kids, just caught in these in these really challenging situations, and they knew it. You know, in some ways, their you know one of them suggested as much to me that he felt like his his experience. You know, he just ex he had just been through Katrina and the flood a few years before this, and now he's in high school, and this is happening to his school, and he felt like his experience growing up in New Orleans in in some ways had become sort of like collateral damage of, of change of progress of, of the way these ways that the city was being remade. And that really stuck with me. And I don't know, it was soon after that, that I, that I started hearing these characters in my mind. Um, so when I, when I think about research, I'm like, okay, I had all these, I observed all these things, not for purposes of research, mm -hmm. but now they're in my head you know, questions arise out of that. Why did something sound a particular way? Or why did, why did this happen? Why did I see that? And those questions come out of it. And then that's where I guess the research begins. And, and, you know, you start talking to people what, about what they know, you start, you know, reading things, mm -hmm. um, you know, a lot of deep dives onto all the, uh, all the narco blogs and all the sort mm -hmm. of like anonymous intrepid reporters who will report on that stuff. Right. Um, um, yeah, a lot of that, a lot of that kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. So you're really, I mean, at the heart of it, the story comes out of your own experience in life, but the research is for looking for details, right. To make sure the details are right. And, yeah. And, and then fill just, they're not filling in, they're doing their points so people don't stop, right. Don't stop and say, Hey, wait a second. And yeah. so that you can experience the heart of it through the writing. Yeah. And I think a lot of that a lot of that polish is always going to come in later too. I think making sure that you've, you've cleaned up those edges, that it is as authentic as can be. 
You know, I know for me, oftentimes, oftentimes in the early drafting stages, um, worrying about authenticity can be a bit of a, of an obstacle. You know, you want it to be there and you know, you're going to put it there eventually to the best of your ability with all possible respect and intelligence. But in the early drafting stage, I know when I start worrying about that stuff, it has a way of, of freezing me up. You can't be, in, in one, yeah, you can't be flipping to Google when you're trying to get, well, that's right. You know, that's right. When you're trying that's to get exactly, a story down. That's exactly what I was going to say. And it's easy to, you know, you have so, so little time to, to be writing anyway. Typically most people do. Um, certainly true for me. And, um, you know, you can convince yourself that if you're going over to Google to check something out, you're doing something productive because you're doing research, but then, you know, you're, you're falling down rabbit holes and then you're, you, and then you haven't written anything. So f- I often find that if you can, if you can imagine it as best you can, based on what you know, in that early drafting period, understanding the responsibility of the research that you're going to have to do later on, you know, I, I, I don't know, that's the way it works best for me, I think. No, I absolutely, I agree yeah. on the same way. I'll draft through knowing that, you know, something might not be perfect, but knowing that as a responsible writer, I'm going to go back, you know, and I'm right. going to look at it and I'm going to make sure that, um, I do my research then, but if you're, if you're, if, especially if you're writing and, and it's coming easily, you don't, that's not the time to go and, you know, go check mm-hmm. a blog, you know what I mean? Because, yeah. um, and so, yeah, I completely understand that. Um, so how long did it take you to write this one? You know, the, I wrote the first words of it in the fall of 2010 and was this pre MFA, post MFA during, um, you know, I, I think I, I think I started it in the last year of my MFA. Mm-hmm. I intended it to be like my graduate thesis. This would be the thing that I would graduate with and I would have mm-hmm. a book written and all that. And, mm-hmm. and you probably know how that goes, you know, <laughs> it was, like, <laughs> it was yeah. um, you know, about a few months later and I said, uh, can I curse on this podcast? Oh, yes, absolutely. Uh, you can totally <laughs> curse. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was going to, I was, you know, a few months later, I, I was like, I looked up and I was like, shit, you know, I'm about to graduate. This thing is not, I don't even have a draft done. Mm-hmm. So, so it became time to scramble and, and, uh, put, put my stories together into a workable collection mm-hmm. and put this on the back burner for a little bit. Um, and so, so then once I graduated, I got back to the, to the novel in earnest and, uh, and it took me about another three and a half years probably to finish, to finish it. Um, all told, I, I don't know, the process probably four and a half, five years, four yeah. of that being writing and rewriting, most of it being rewriting, and then uh, another year finding a home for it. Yeah. Um, once you found a home, though, any more rewriting? Um, a little bit at the, at the beginning, you know, a little bit, a little bit with, with my agent, mm-hmm. um, and then a little bit more with my editor. But once it, once it got to the, you know, I guess all the rewriting was sort of before it found the home, you know, I did, I did some rewriting with, with my agent and, and, um, and then once it was, you know, once an offer was made or once somebody expressed interest in it, it was, it was pretty much in shape, you know, and the, and the rest of the editing that came after that was, was relatively small things. Yeah. Well, you have a great agent. You know, yeah. She, yeah. 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 Um, she's pretty yeah. smart. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Elizabeth Cox. Yeah. yeah. She, uh, she's the same agent here. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Same yeah. Agent. yeah. 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 I forgot the, the podcast is going to be, it, people are going to listen to this, but we're looking at each other on FaceTime. So I gave you a knowing nod when, yeah. I, said, when I said my agent. Yeah. yeah. She's, uh, she's got a great eye. She really does. And, um, yeah. Uh-huh. I, I don't know if, um, she's ever given me advice that I didn't like or take. You know, just because right. um, she really does have a great eye with with story. Um, so five, six, it's, it came out uh, December, November, November twenty sixteen. Yeah, actually, oh, so let's, let's. I can do the math on that. I guess that's that's about that's about six years and a and a month from when I started it. <laughs> yeah, that's. Uh, I wish I I wish I could say that that's uncommon, but it's not. So anyone listening, no. any writers here that l- are listening and thinking that you're going to bust out a NaNoWriMo and then you're going to get, <laughs> and then in, in December, you're going to get an agent. And then in January, you're going to have a book deal. Right. And then uh-huh. in June, it'll come out. That doesn't happen. Yeah. Um, no. So if you're taking yourself seriously, <laughs> listen to Nick. It took six years from concept to uh, uh, thrashing in the MFA to moving on to finishing the book and then going forward. Yeah. 
I want to hear and like, you, and how, yeah, but it's worth it. Like, I want to hear how much oh, it's worth yeah. it though. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I was, <laughs> I was going to say, you know, that like pissed me off the whole time, you know, <laughs> that, it was, that, it was, that it was taking that long. Um, but, but now I feel like, now I feel like sort of grudgingly accepted the, the process of it, you know, because I realized things about the story at like year four, I don't know how I would have realized those things any more quickly than I did. Yeah. And it's not that I wasn't trying, you know, but those ideas for whatever reason surfaced at that time, yeah. you know, and then when, and then when, when, uh, I hooked up with Elizabeth, our agent, you know, she had insight that really made this book a whole hell of a lot better. Mm-hmm. You know, she, I, I wasn't, ha- you know, I, I wasn't doing that myself a couple years before that, that, that happened when I met Elizabeth. So, you know, the, the process, I think it has to, well, what I'm telling myself is it has to take as long as it has to take, you know, the, you know, you never know, you never know what it is that, that, um, that's going to surface and inform the novel. You know, I was writing this, this 17 year old pregnant character, never having any experience mm-hmm. with pregnancy myself. And in the, you know, in the last couple of years of working on this, my wife became pregnant, yeah, you know, absolutely. and then that, that informed the novel, you mm-hmm. know, I have to, at, at reading sometimes if my wife and our, our now uh, almost two year old son, if they're at the reading, I like to claim that he was, he was for research, you know, <laughs> but, <laughs> uh, she probably doesn't love it when you say that she was as well. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> He's um, okay. But, uh, those nine yeah. months of her research, uh, my wife yeah. might kick me for that. Yeah. No, yeah, no, it's all, it's all, in, it's all a joke. Yeah, absolutely. Course, but, yeah. But yeah, but those things happen and then they make the book better and there's no way to rush, you know, the life experience that's going to inform it in the ways that you can't anticipate, you know. Yeah. Well, it's a beautiful book. If you haven't read it yet, uh, it's been ordered uh, at our local bookstore at Booked on 25th. Uh, Marcy down at Booked on 25th has 10 copies right now. Um, So if you're listening to this, please get down to Booked on 25th and buy The Infinite by Nicholas Maneri. We're talking today about the book, about the process, about Mexico, about research, about all those things that go into um, something that is... Well, I guess we can say birthed out of these uh, processes, uh, <laughs> even though we've never researched it ourselves. Um, so do go down to Marcy's, go down to Booked on 25th, your local bookstore, support your local independent bookstore, uh, support Nick in his um, in his writing and buy The Infinite. It's a great book. I've read it. I finished it. I'm, I'm not a fast reader. It usually takes me about six months to read a book because I'm, re- I'm usually, <laughs> I, it's true, I'm usually reading three or four at a time and writing at the same time and... Um, I read this in about, it was about three weeks, which is really good for me. Um, and I enjoyed, I enjoyed it a lot. I enjoyed the characters. Both of them are, are, have a lot of depth. And even though they're 17 years old, they have a lot of depth, you know, and that's a really cool book. A lot of people write 17 year olds and the depth in which they write them is let's say shallow, but Nick's, Nick's done a really good job at introducing these characters that carry you through the book are these, these dual protagonists that take you from new Orleans to, from new Orleans to this uh, central Mexico and Northeast Mexico. And then that's all I'm not going to say anymore. <laughs> so, sometimes I feel like my 17 year old self had more depth than my 40 year old self. So I, you never know. Yeah, yeah. I actually know mine did not. I, uh, I always say, I always say that I'm so glad I didn't meet, meet my wife until my late twenties because there yeah. was no way she would have dated me. There is absolutely no. Way. I should mention, and I did saw, and this is just another plug for, um, booked on 25th street. Marcy mentioned, we have a snowstorm here in Ogden. You can go to booked on 25th.com and order the book. So, mm-hmm. and then you can make sure that it's in stock when you go down, just uh, order the infinite online booked on 25th, and then you can buy it from your local bookstore. Absolutely. We buy it through Marcy. Um, it's, it really is a really good book. I enjoyed all of it. Um, there's, and there's, and Nick and I briefly talked about this before, but there's some beautiful prose in this book too. And, um, I, I'm not going to say that we don't see a lot of beautiful prose in, in the stuff, in the stuff that we read, but this book is full of it. There are moments, there's <laughs> landscape. Um, you're there. We, we get a really nice mix of this literary description where we're pushing the plot line through the description, uh, through, through the mountains in Mexico, um, where you're looking at a lot of times where the, the landscape itself is a character. Uh, it's, it's a beautiful book and uh, you really should pick it up. 
So that's all of the questions I have, Nick. Do you have anything else to share about this book particularly that you want your readers to know? Well, or the next book. Well, you, you just said some really nice things. Thank you. No, you're ab- <laughs> they're, I'm very, I'm very, it's very true. It's a beautiful book. Yeah, I appreciate it, man. Thank you. Um, I don't know what else I should add. Um, I don't know. It's just got short chapters. That helps. <laughs> Lots of pictures. And no, no, no. no, it's guy. It does. It has short chapters, which I enjoy, especially when it takes me six months to read a book and I read it yeah. in three weeks. It was really, it's, they're great. They're, they're, they, do you always write in short chapters like that? Or is that for this one? No, that sort of came out in, in writing this book. Um, I, I don't know. I came to that some, at some point in the, in the process. Part of that I think is, is, you know, I teach as well and do, do some other things and, when, when your time is, is strapped like that, I sort of started thinking to myself, okay, let me just write one scene, you know, a couple mm-hmm. pages and, and breaking it up in that way into usable, um, or into like manage, manageable sizes. And it, and it, re- and it really worked, I thought, and I like the way it turned out and keeps it going. I mean, one thing I'm proud of in this novel is I think it, I think it has the emotional depth. Um, but it's also, it's also got a pretty good, um, pace to it, it moves along. Some things happen. They got to deal with some bad stuff. Yeah. You know, I, I think it balances those things. Um, well, or at least I'm proud of the way that it does. We'll see what the reader says. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I agree. And that's what I was, that's what I was talking about. Like with this kind of narrative descriptive voice where we're pushing through description, but at the same time, it never slows. It's never, a, it's not a book where you get into description and the book, you know, kind of falls and th- the pace stops. I mean, it's a book that w- the description, the narrative description throughout um, is all in service to the plot. And the mix of that is as writers, it's really difficult to do. I know that's difficult to do. Um, so when you pick it up, you'll see that. And that's, it's pretty, it's pretty darn cool. Um, do you have any more questions, Brandon? No, it's, uh, no I, I was honest. First of all, I'm, I'm, I haven't read it. So this is new to me. Uh, the case lines up the interviews, but, uh, uh, I can, the only thing I can claim is that I have a, a degree in English creative writing. <laughs> that's about as far as I get. Yeah. But so I, I'm always curious about, uh, your personal, uh, style like the way when when you write how you write how you go about it is this something you set aside time for or uh you write just whenever you feel creative you know what's your technique um i'm a firm believer in in doing it every day you know it's it's um the it's a i don't know it's a discipline almost like a physical discipline right if like i don't know lifting weights or something you know, if you, if you stop lifting weights for a while, you're not going to be able to lift as much as you, as you did, you know, a couple months ago. Um, and, and so for me, some days are better than others, like inspiration wise, if the inspiration is there, but if I'm sitting there and doing it every day, then I'm always working on it. And sooner or later that inspiration is going to turn up. Um, I like writing early in the morning, you know, I wish I could be one of these nighttime writers, especially now, especially now that I'm a dad, you know, but, um, but, but I like, I like, yeah. And I, I like the early morning before, before my day is, or my mind is sort of cluttered with the day, you know, get this out of the way first. And then I feel better too. Oh, I, yeah. I'm, I am exactly like you. 5 a.m. coffee. Yeah. My brain's still a little fuzzy and that's my best writing. Um, cause then, yeah. cause once you talk to students during the day and you know this, mm-hmm. your brain's gone. You know, cause you, you know, yeah. I mean, students are fantastic, but it takes so much to, to work with their writing. And yeah. are we that bad? No, no, no. They're fantastic. <laughs> I love my students, but you're creati- There's a lot of, there's a lot of creativity in working with students and you can't zap Absolutely. it. Um, and I'm a coffee early morning drinker, the exact same early morning coffee drinker. Um, and I'm the exact same way. And how old's your son now? His girl, uh, he's going to be two, two. Uh, son. Yeah. yeah. He's going to be two in April. Yeah. Too. So he still kind of like wakes up when he wants to in the morning, right? Yeah. Sometimes weird yeah. hours, like three and four, and then sometimes like seven. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm going to tell and you he's this. He's awesome. He's fun. Yeah. You know, but the thing is like writing, yeah, I need to do it and I like doing it. And it's, you know, one of the most important things I do to me personally. Um, but you know, if I'm sitting here writing and he's up and he's playing, I, I, I want to play with him. Yeah. You know? Yeah. <laughs> so, and sometimes, yeah. yeah, absolutely. And I, um, I wrote a lot during that time when Lucas was zero to, well, five. He's five now. One thing that I can tell you, once they hit mm-hmm. five, 
they are sleeping in. So you can get up at five and you can count on at least an hour and a half of writing. That is a, it's gold. It is golden that way. It really, really is like, cause at two and three, you might get up at four and your kid gets up at four 30 and you're like, Oh, yeah. I didn't get anything done. You know, um, yeah. but at five, get up at f- when he, once he started turn five, he sleeps until we get him out of bed. And so you can count on those hours and it's, it is wonderful. Um, that is, yeah. And that I love is my, good to know, man. My, Thank it you. is really cool. <laughs> and my boy is my entire life. And my wife and yeah. I, we we're really lucky that we do like 50, 50 parenting because I'm, I teach and I'm able to, you know, do yeah. that as well. And or I love that kid more than anything in the world, but man, that hour and a half, when you know, you're going to be able to write is really fantastic. Yeah. It really yeah. is. And then I, oh, that brings me up to one thing that I thought at the end. So loose is light, right? Uh-huh. And Lucas is also a light bearer, right? Uh-huh. And there's a point in the book where obviously there's a Lucas and then there's a loose and I, I, you'll just have to wait and see what happens. <laughs> 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 so there's two light bearers in the book and, uh, and the, and the way you spell Lucas in the book is the same way I spell our Lucas. Uh-huh. I was like, no, I can't think of him this way. Nick, yeah. what are you doing to me, man? No, no. You, well, the, well, the Lucas in the book is not a very nice person. No, he's not a nice person. No. And so I was, I, I, there was one point I was angry with you. Um, yeah. but, uh, <laughs> but you got to read the book to find out. Um, this is Case Johnston. It's literally podcast. Uh, today we're actually at my home and not at book 20. Booked on 25th. Uh, we are interviewing Nicholas Maneri in his book, The Infinite, uh, recently published in November uh, from Harper Perennial. Uh, thanks, Nick, for joining us. It's, uh, it's been really fun to talk with you. I've had a great time, guys. Hey, Nick, where can we find, uh, where can we follow you if we're a fan? You got a website and everything? And oh, yeah. yeah. My, um, my website is my name, Nicholas Maneri, which, um, which I suppose I should spell that yeah, M A I N I E R I, and then I'm on I'm on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, all the usual, all the usual places. Okay, so yeah. uh, coming from a marketing background, uh, in your in your younger uh, versus um, I don't know the, the the older author, how how are you using the internet, the social media to help you sell your book? Uh, grudgingly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I get. I, no, I don't know. It's okay. Yeah. Um, um, Is it? You know, I, don't, I put I don't, stuff do, out there every once in a while. Do publishers um, expect you? Like, do they give you standards, or is this just something that you implement to yourself? I think so. You know, I, I was on some of it at the start. Elizabeth, who we mentioned, our agent, really encouraged me to get on um, all of it and and be able to use it. Um, and you know. It's actually been kind of nice. You know, I've met people through it. Mm-hmm. Um, Kate, Case and I have hooked up through it. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it's uh, it, it, there have been nice things that have happened because of it. And, and you know, I've, I've been at readings and things and a couple people have come up to me and said, hey, I saw this on Facebook and I'm here, you know. So yeah. so it, so it does. Yeah. So it does. Um, it yeah. yeah, it does work, actually. And then, you know, you, every once in a while you have really nice interactions with people on there, um, you know, but I don't really know that much about using it, like how to use it effectively yeah. or anything like that. And I know some, it can grate on some people when you, when you're too self-promotional or if, you know, if you keep, you know, you know, belaboring certain political points or whatever, you know, I don't know I, the people that I, the social media accounts that I see that I enjoy watching the most are the people who just seem to be having the most fun, yeah. um, most fun with it. And then I got a good piece of advice along, along the way from a marketing person, who said like Twitter, for instance, I said, Hey, you're really good at Twitter. Uh, uh, what, what do I do? And, and this person said, um, you know what, like 30% of the time tweet about your work, 30% of the time promote other people's work mm-hmm. and 30% of the time just talk about whatever you want to talk about. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Said, okay. Yeah, that's mm-hmm. pretty cool. Absolutely. Thanks Nicholas for joining us. Um, literally podcast. And like I said before, Go buy the book. Buy the book through Booked on 25th if you're local here in Utah. If you somehow get away from Utah, buy it from Nick personally. Go find him. <laughs> get it. We, we want to support our authors. We want to support our local independent bookstores. Uh, we want to uh, support this wonderful book. Go out and buy it. All right, thanks. Awesome. Thanks, Nick. Thank you, guys. Yep. yep.